Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia and this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and welcome to episode 9. As always, I am very excited and very happy to be sitting down and to film an episode today. It's been two weeks since the last episode and I'm really glad to say that there has been some meaningful progress on a lot of the things I had talked about in the last podcast and then there's a new cast on that you haven't seen and a few exciting acquisitions as well as plans for the future. So yeah, what better time to sit down and chat to you all. It's been a lovely day today. I just spent um, the day in the sun, knitting with a friend and thinking about yarn, as you do on a great Saturday afternoon. As always, before we get started in the video, I'll just do a few admin points. If you want to find me on other social media, I am on Instagram and on Ravelry at The Woolly Worker. Same as here on YouTube, if you want to find more information on my projects on Ravelry or if you want to see stories and finished item photos on Instagram then I'd love to see you there. And I always keep a very detailed description box below where you can find links to the patterns and projects that I mentioned, yarn, yarn colors, and people or places I mentioned in case they are uh, relevant or important. But if I'm forgetting anything, then don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I read every comment and I also reply to every message on Instagram. So yeah, I'd love to chat to you if you desire. For this episode, I will talk about what I am wearing first, which I hope you notice is finished. I've shown that on the podcast last time. I will talk about three finished items, two works in progress, and then, like I said, a couple of acquisitions. So I don't think today should be too, too long, but who even knows at this point? Before we get started, actually, I wanted to mention that someone had won the giveaway a couple episodes back and they never got in touch with me. So I'm going to say your name now. Sharon Thompson, you won the yarn last time. Can you please get in touch with me? If you do not get in touch with me in the next couple of weeks, then I will have to pick a second winner and then I will send the yarn to them because I can't hold on to it forever. So yeah, Sharon Thompson, please get in touch using any of the details that are in the description below. And as a last point, thanks again to everyone who kindly commented on my latest video. It was a knit and chat where I opened up a little bit about the kind of pressures I put on myself and uh, trends in knitting, the effects of social media like Instagram can have on people. And it seemed to have resonated with a lot of you and it was really, really great to read all the comments and people's perspectives and stories and, and um, experiences. So thank you so much if you're one of the people who commented. It was really, it was a little scary to, to put that video out there and I wasn't quite sure the response it would get. So uh, I'm really glad that I did put it out and I will be doing more knit and chat in the future. But let's get started for the actual uh, podcast episode. So as you can see, I am wearing one of my finished items. This is the Mist Sketch Sweater from Handmade by Florence, Florence Miller. She is a podcaster and designer based in England and she does stunning pieces. She has an eye for color and detail and she's really good at writing patterns. I've made her step-by-step -step sweater last year. It was a free pattern. I also recommend that piece. It's uh, knitted at a big gauge, so it was really quick to do. And then this sweater is knitted on a DK gauge, so it was also quite fast. This was a test knit that I did for her. I was very excited to be picked to do it because I really, uh, this sweater really caught my eye when I first saw it on her podcast or Instagram. I think it was on her podcast that she showed it. So I will talk about the yarn that I used. I use Isiger Alpaca 1 and Alpaca 2 held together. So Isiger Alpaca 2 is a fingering weight 50% alpaca, 50% wool, and this is the color 46. And then I used the color E0 for the contrast. And then alpaca 1 is a lace weight, 100% alpaca, color 46 and E0 as well. And together they form a DK. Uh, I thought I might struggle at first to reach gauge and that it wouldn't give me the fabric I wanted that Florence gets with mohair or other people have gotten with a single strand of DK. But it all worked out in the end the swatching was really helpful to know how the fabric would behave. And when I was first knitting it up, I was noticing that the fabric was quite uneven. The stitches were looking very open and gapy, but with wash, it really fluffed up and bloomed. And the fabric is not holy at all. Like I can't see my skin and it is next to skin soft. I am not wearing anything underneath. It's really cozy, really warm, uh, but not overly so. Like it was a really warm day today, but my flat 
is not as warm as it is outside so I can comfortably wear this and I'm happy to because I wanted to show it off on the podcast. The pattern is just a simple raglan. I think it's a compound raglan where different sizes have different rates of increases especially towards the end and it's a simple one by one color work design. You cast on at the neck line and then you work your way down and then you work the body for a certain amount of centimeters and you just do some simple rib. I will show photos on screen if I haven't already as I'm speaking of b-roll uh, videos, footage or also just photos of me modeling the jumper so you can see what it is like on a, a, a body from, from far away and from up close. Um, I always put b-roll and I was actually wondering if I put too much so let me know if it's overwhelming when I keep on flashing photos on screen. I think I like it when podcasters do it, I like it when they include photos in b-roll, that's why I'm doing it, but let me know if it's too much. So anyway, you do it normal rib with no color work and then you pick up for the sleeves and you do the sleeves, there's a few decreases and then you do uh, some color work as well. And then here the bottom of the sleeve as well as the neck is corrugated ribbing, which I had never done before and basically corrugated ribbing is when you're doing you know, knit one in one color and then pearl one in your contrasting color or vice versa. And this creates uh, some ribbing that is less elastic, less stretchy. Although mine is quite stretchy still with the alpaca that I chose. I think alpaca is by nature just very loose and drapey. So she does recommend going down a few needle sizes to, to, to get the neck to kind of cinch in. Uh, the neck edge is picked up and the instructions are really clear and detailed on how many stitches to pick up and, and where, so that was no problem at all. I did find it tricky at first to decide on color dominance, I talked about that in my previous podcast, but I didn't want the white lines to be too strong, so I actually held green dominant in the color work, which I don't know if you can tell from here or from the close-ups that you will see. I think the white is very prevalent here and you can definitely see it a lot. I think it could have been even worse if I had held the white dominant, so I'm really happy about my choice to hold the green dominant. So if you're intending to make the sweater, I'd highly, highly recommend that. When you're swatching, you should try both and see what you prefer. However, for the corrugated rib, I had to hold white dominant because of the way I was holding my yarn for the knits and pearls. And at first I thought it was going to be quite jarring the way that this switches, um, but I don't think it's a big problem, the sleeve. I think the white is obviously more obvious here than it is down, but I think it's subtle. And I really, really like this, this jumper. I like how it looks on camera. Um, the sleeves are a bit long, but like in a comfy way, I think it's not gonna bother me. It's just like, I just can pull them up and, and I really like it. I was afraid at first that it was gonna be too cropped when I, reached the length stated in the pattern and had to stop knitting, I was like, oh, is that it? That's that's weird. I'll put a video here of me showing off the sweater when it wasn't blocked. And then when I blocked it, it really lengthened. I didn't aggressively block or anything. I kind of tried on purpose to like lower the, the bottom a little bit. Something that I need to buy myself are blocking pins that are like in the comb instead of the individual pins. I never individually pin a sweater because I don't want it to be all pointy and like, you know, yeah, like scalloped. So I don't pin my sweaters when I block them, I just put them down, but I think I need to get those like straight blocking pins. Anyway, I tried to lengthen the body, tried to make sure that the sleeves didn't lengthen too much because they were already feeling long without blocking. And then after it blocked, it, it, it was just beautiful. Like the drape of it is amazing. You can see in the photos. The length of everything is, is great. The neck is the thing I was the most worried about and the thing that I was a bit sad about in the last episode. Um, when I had just done the yoke, the neck was fine. But then I picked up for the neck, did the corrugated rib and I tried it on and it looked awful, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And I immediately bought some elastic because I thought, how am I going to rescue this? I bought the elastic and I didn't use it. And I haven't used it yet, actually. This is without elastic. But I trusted the process, decided to do the sleeves and after I had done one or two sleeves I tried it on again and it was already looking better and then after finishing the sweater and trying it on it looked great and then after blocking it just looks perfect. So this is a mock neck or funnel, funnel neck, I'm not quite sure what the difference is and the, the trick with corrugated ribbing is that 
You don't want it to be so tight and not elastic enough that you can't put it over your head, but you don't want it to like stand very rigidly upwards and your head is like in the middle. So I think that's the, the, the tricky, the, the difficult thing to get. But I think I like it. Um, I think I might have to put some elastic after a while, so I'll see if that happens. It's alpaca and I can feel a bit of, not itchiness, but my skin is more sensitive here. And I don't know if I like that the alpaca is going all the way up to my neck. So what I might do later on, depending on how I feel with time, is I might fold the neck all the way um, and maybe sew it down and make it like a double folded neck like this. I think that could be quite cute as well. And it wouldn't require much effort. I bound off with Italian bind off. So it is like a stretchy bind off. And I did that same at the sleeves. I didn't do the two set of rounds, it was just um, a sewn bind off, not tubular. The floats are really cool on the inside. I'll show you a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that's everything. Oh, so I have one and a half ball of this left, of the green. And I think that's just about enough to get me a sweater vest. So what I might do is another Stockholm slipover by Petit Net. I made one in a light grey and it's honestly one of my most worn slipovers because it's just so simple and neutral and versatile. And I'm really digging this green colour and yeah, I think it would be really cool to have a slipover like that. So I think I'm going to do that. I don't know, it's not a priority because I have other things I'm more excited about. But I have left over. It was quite surprising to see how little white I used for the entire thing. Definitely could have gotten away with just buying one kind of the white alpaca too. I put all the details in my Ravelry page if you want to check out like the actual yardages that I used. I made the size 2 for this sweater and it does seem to have quite a lot of ease. Mm, I was on gauge, but yeah, I, I love it. I think it's it, everything goes well together, like the soft contrast, the oversized sleeves and ease. Um, it's just, I'm really happy I did this project and uh, thanks again Florence for letting me test knit this sweater and I, I recommend it if anyone wants to try. If you have never done color work before, I think this would be fine because it's just one by one. Uh, just make sure to gauge swatch with and without color work because one by one color work is definitely something that can affect gauge even more so than normal color work. And make sure that you understand color dominance is my other tip for this project. I think that's it. I'll put the price below here of what it cost. Like I said, it was less than expected because I used less yarn than expected. Um, and I don't know if this would have been much more expensive with mohair. It definitely could be cheaper if you just use a single strand of DK. So overall, it's quite an affordable um, sweater. And I'd recommend the yarn combination that I used. At first, I wasn't too, too sure because I thought it might have been unwise to do this kind of color work with alpaca 1 and alpaca 2 but I, I take it back I really loved alpaca 1 and alpaca 2 held together I have a sweater quantity to make a sweater with this it's like a rusty color they're both like the same uh, the same shade in, in the two yarn qualities and I cannot wait to make another sweater out of this I really love it and I think I'm going to reach for this all the time especially in a uh, colder month but I think it still has a few weeks of, of being able to be worn this season. Okay, I think that's it for, for that because I talked about it before, but let me know if you have any questions, like I said. The next project is a crochet shawl. So the little backstory behind this is that I am participating in the Royal Highland Show in Edinburgh. It's a sort of um, yarn farmers show where people can show like livestock and everything but there's also an arts and craft fair that goes with it and they were some prompts uh, the prompt for knitting were shades of purple the prompts for crochet were shades of blue i think purple is like my least favorite color but more on that later and blue is my favorite color so i went for crochet instead of knitting which uh, i i wish i could have done knitting but maybe next year this is going to be extremely hard to show in this frame but I will show the pictures that we took yesterday it was really fun to 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 be able to capture this in its uh, glory because it, it doesn't look as good inside like on a bed or something but it's being uh, on a on the bench I'll show you the bench the bench photo is really really great so this was done with a three millimeter hook for the lace part 
and then a 2.5 millimeter hook for the mosaic. This is by the way the Everblue Shawl by Lilia Bjorn Crochet. She has amazing crochet blankets. If you want to check her Ravelry out, it's, it's mesmerizing, it's very geometrical, which I have a, an affinity for. I really like her geometrical patterns. So this was a deadline knit because I need to register my entry and I need to send it off in the post and get it back afterwards. But I'll, I'll go to the show and, and hopefully win, you know, like first place, second place, any place would be good. Uh, you get like 10 pounds for, for first place. So that would be great. Um, I use sheep cheese. There's a whirl, which is the gradient yarn. And then I use two whirlets, one in ice, the white, and one in bilberry, the dark blue. And that was for the mosaic. But I'll show you the shawl. So this is, you, you can see here already, there's uh, triangles made of lace. This is all double crochet, the US term. So I guess treble in UK. And you can see little triangles and they're like, you know, the same size, like all, all edges are the same size. I don't know the term for that in uh, English. Isocel in French. And uh, there's mosaic crochet at the bottom. And actually I stopped pretty much halfway the mosaic border was supposed to be twice as big, but I thought that it threw off the balance a little bit and it would have been more body than border. Like a border is supposed to be just that, a border and not as like wide. And I'm really happy with the way that it kind of like it half mirrors itself, but not like quite. Like it's not a perfect mirror, but it's balanced. So I'm really happy with where I stopped in the border. I love the contrast between the lace and the mosaic. And now I will unfold this and try and show you yeah i cannot show the whole thing although that's kind of it uh, and then the point there we go so yeah i'm really proud of myself and really happy that i did it i hope that the judges can see it i don't know how they're going to display it i don't think they're gonna hang it i think it'll just be like laid flat on something I guess I could wear this like on the couch. I was wondering if I was gonna use this shawl. Like I don't think I'll wear it out because it is more cover than shawl. It is massive. I feel like it'll just be nice to like, yeah, be cozy and comfy and wrap myself in for um, an inside. If I don't want to wear a blanket, I can wear a shawl. It's made of acrylic and cotton, the yarn. So it's not the warmest either. And obviously it's laced and like drapey. It's quite interesting, the difference in fabric, like the mosaic is much stiffer and the lace is extremely drapey, but I don't think it bothers me too much. Here's the wrong side of the mosaic, if you're curious. The mosaic technique that you do has you do like two rounds of blue and then two rounds of white and then two rounds of blue. And then you're carrying the ends on the edge, like those little lines are my ends. Uh, and you just, because you're carrying them, you're not cutting it. So there's not that many ends to even at the end. I may have run out of white if I had done the entire mosaic border, but I didn't. And it was partly because I knew I might run out of white and because I wanted to be done and because it would have looked too big of the mosaic. So I'm happy I stopped where I did. Definitely a good decision. I need to have a drink. Uh, okay, so I think that's all there is to say about the Everblue shawl. I've already talked about it, I think, in two different podcast episodes. So yeah, I'll put the price here of what it ended up being. It was just those three balls, basically. So um, I I'd love it if one of you made it in a different gradient. I had to pick blue because of the theme of the Edinburgh Royal Highland show, but it would look really, really pretty on some other gradients, especially gradients that are like two-toned. This was also part of a knit along that was on Facebook. So as I was doing it, I was seeing quite a lot of people showing their versions. Um, also, this was made using charts mostly. So that was a nice way of practicing reading charts. Uh, the crochet charts can be a little different than the knitting charts. They can be more like drawings, like, you know, like radiating from like a magic ring and you get those little crosses. I'll put an, Im an image here of a crochet chart, which can be like quite different than the, a knitting cable chart or lace chart. So it was nice to, to try that out. So yeah, happy I did that. Happy to do some crochet. I don't know if I'll do some crochet next. 
but it's not my first project with the sheep cheese whirlet and it won't be the last. Oh, actually the last thing to say about that is that I haven't blocked it yet. I don't think you can tell that much, like on the photos it looked pretty great, but I will block it closer to the time because if I blocked it now, I pretty much have to store it, lay it flat, otherwise it would crease again. Um, I want it to look its best for the show, so yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just block it later and send it off to the show and hope that people can, can see it as it was intended. It was a free pattern, by the way. Someone had asked me uh, last time. It's not free on, on Ravelry. Like, the first thing that you see is that it's paid for. But if you go on their website, it's free. And I think it will stay free for for that long, I hope. Um, so yeah, if you just want an ad-free PDF printer-friendly version, you can pay on Ravelry. But if you want a free version, you can just go on the website. So I'd recommend the pattern. Okay, the next item uh, I'm, I'm really really happy about it was very out of the blue because I was doing so many deadline knits some of you have noticed in the previous podcast I was like a little overwhelmed by all the test knitting and people told me to take it easy and that's also what I did like I didn't tell myself you must do even more deadlines or you must do this I was just like I already have it up on my plate I'll just do what I have to do and then out of the blue inspiration struck and I was able to finish my second extra Easter socks oh they are the cutest. So this was actually my first uh, color work sock that I've ever done, the first one, and then I left it for two months. And then I uh, last week picked up the needles and made the second sock. And I finished it in two days. Like granted, I was knitting obsessively for two days, but it was very fast to do the second one. And I think my color work has improved from sock one to sock two, because in between those two, I've made my rosy socks that I showed last time, which were more challenging as well. So my color work sock knitting has gotten better, which is really nice. The little socks, the little chicken, they've got some like duplicate stitching for the beak and the, the wattle, I think is like the red thing that they've got there. So um, yeah, you can see the duplicate stitching, which is fine, like nothing to write home about. So you do the, the cuff color work, uh, there's a slipped, like, there's a, a gusset flap, a flap and gusset. There's a, an error in the pattern, in the book, that uh, she says it's a slipped stitch heel. And then she gives instructions for a ribbed heel, where it's like knit one, purl one, and then purl all on the wrong side. And I confirmed with her that it was a mistake, it should have just been like knit one, slip one, like a normal slipped stitch edge. But I did it in the ribbing anyway, to see what it would be like, basically. And it's fine. It looks funny. It looks nice. It looks very bouncy and stretchy. I guess it is quite... It is more stretchy than it normally would be. Then there's a, a nice um, broken rib pattern here on the, le uh, the, the foot. And then, oh, the toe. The toe is so amazing they look great when they're on i'll put some photos on the screen as i'm speaking as well so you can see them being worn on my feet uh, and yeah one of them feels a tad tighter than the other but not in like an annoying way and i'm sure that it'll stretch out anyway my socks have a tendency to stretch out which is why i'm trying to make them on smaller needles and maybe try smaller stitch counts those were like size two which was like pretty much 64 stitches there's a bit of um, like instructions for, for the color work where like you have to increase your stitches and increase needle size. Like it's from Charlotte Stone, by the way, I, I didn't mention this from her Charming Color Work Sock book. Uh, she has a lot of different tips on how to do color work socks, but it's just trial and error and finding what works for you. So what I had done was I had cast on my 64 stitches for my size, but then I actually decreased my amount of stitches for the color work and I went one needle size up. So it was a mess. I had done a lot of things on like the first sock, such as like those changes. And I had tried to keep good notes of what I was doing. So I would say on my Ravelry notes, like, ooh, after you do this color work round, change to the bigger needles. Like anytime that I would do something that wasn't in the book, I would, I would write that down. So that when I would make the second one, I could make them as identical as possible. And I'm pleased to say that past Venetia did a good job at writing down notes that would be useful for future Venetia. So when I made that second sock, I was basically reading my own notes to see what to do 
And there was only one point where I wasn't sure, but everything else I was able to basically replicate what I had done. So really happy with that. Not that it matters like that much. If I didn't do, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that much that they're identical. I've become much less of a perfectionist with socks because like everything is so tiny. So like one stitch off or one round off won't affect it at all. Uh, these were made using scraps basically because I had the blue for like my boyfriend socks I made earlier the white is from like the Una socks and then the yellow is also from my like stripey socks I had made for myself at the beginning of the year they're all West Yorkshire spinner signature for ply this is butterscotch marshmallow and juniper but all the colors are on my Ravelry project and then the tiny bit of red is Malabrigo sock in Ravelry red you literally need like what like a meter of the red uh, let's say two three meters to be sure but you don't need to buy a new thing of red for that same for the white and the yellow is really not much and then because they're ankle socks there's also not much of the blue so those would be the perfect scrappy project and come on it's it's chicken it's an egg what's not to love i'm really happy i made them i have so many other of her patterns on my favorite list and and Q. some of are from the book some are just like from her regular published patterns they're they're just so nice she has an eye for catchy designs and like nice details for example this broken rib body i i really like and then sometimes they have different heels which i want to try out like i really want to try some short row heels because i always seem to do heel flap and gussets you can also buy this pattern alone. She released it at Easter. So yeah, if you want to do just this pattern, but you don't want to do the other ones of the book or you don't want to buy a book, then you can just buy this pattern. So I'll put here the price of what it ended up being. The way that I calculate my project cost is I calculate it like per meter, per yard. So it's not like I buy five balls, it costs five balls. Like if I used four and a half balls, I'll put the price of four and a half balls for situations like this where I had all the balls already and I, the, the, all the balls had been used already for a different project and this is with the rest of that. So these actually have a cost. So that's kind of the background of my project cost that I always put at the bottom of uh, finished items. So yeah, the next socks I want to do are either a ruffle sock, like an ankle ruffle sock that I could wear with trainers or I want to make another one with my West Yorkshire Spinner self-striping bird colorway and I could make it in broken rib just like kind of make up the pattern as I go and I want to try the fish lips kiss heel that I bought recently because it seems like a very interesting technique to learn and to master okay so those were all my finished items uh, a garment a sock and a crochet shawl so really really happy to have finished two of the deadline knits there's one more deadline and I will show it to you now. This is the Pictus Pullover Test Knit by Tetis Lutzak. I don't know what I was thinking when I signed up. I It was advertised as like a four ply slash sport weight color work sweater. And I guess I just saw sport weight and thought to myself, oh, that'll be fine and that'll be fast. And it looked really gorgeous, but I was in over my head and it ended up being much more time consuming and difficult than I thought it would be. This was my swatch, so I'm using um, Woolly Knit Merino as my contrast color in the gold colorway. And then for my body, I'm using yarn that I bought at the Perth Festival of Yarn, Wool Producer Showcase that I went to in February. And uh, it's from Hawkshaw Sheep, I'll put the details below. It's like a nice fawn natural colorway that just like hasn't been dyed or anything. It is really, really pretty. And then I'm holding it with the uh, cone of gold. And last time I think I had cast on and started the yoke. I think I had done a really, really small amount of color work yoke. And since then I have done the entire body. <laughs> this is looking tiny, but the neck is very, the neckline is quite low and it's cropped. So this is looking, <laughs> this is so funny that it fits in the frame like this. And on camera here, I'm liking it more. It looks more even, but in person it's a mess. I swear, I'll put some b-roll, to be perfectly honest. I want you to see what I'm seeing. It's very bumpy. Uh, it's gonna stretch out and even out in the wash. My swatch looks quite different than it than this. 
So the yarn will bloom and expand and the stitches will even out and the floats are gonna like tighten a little bit because they're quite loose. Um, yeah, I'm liking it more seeing it on camera, which is a good sign. I just, so I finished the, the, the body this morning. I, I bound off the knitting. I just did like a tubular bind off. There's a long version and a cropped version and I, I did the cropped one. So it's a circular yoke and then it's all over body <laughs> color work. There's no, there's no secret. There's a few rows per flower repeat that have floats you need to catch, which can slow you down. Then the sleeves, you pick them up and there's a bit more flowers and then it'll, it'll just be straight stockinette. So I've got two more weeks to do this. So one week per sleeve would be good. Originally, the neckline is supposed to just be as such, like you cast it on and you go. But since the designer has come back and said that if we're experiencing rolling up, which I do, you can pick it up and do an edge. So you can do a, a, a few rounds of ribbing in small needles, or you could do an applied eye cord. And I think I'm going to go for the eye cord just for change, because it's quite cropped already. I, I don't know if it would look good with ribbing. I think I'll do an eye cord first. If I don't like it, I'll rip it out and do some ribbing. I think I'm going to go for the same needle size that I used for the body and then just pick up stitches all around and do a four stitch eye cord. Uh, yeah, I think this looks better. This this is not bad, actually, once it's here, but in person, it's just messy. When I see other people post their versions on Instagram, they all look really good. And then I see mine and I'm like, am I a bad knitter? Like, have I lost it? Can I not do color work anymore? I don't know if it's the yarn. I think it is the yarn. The yarn is quite, like the gray one is a bit weird, but then you block it and it gets better. Whereas some yarns are going to be looking neat, like from the start. I don't know. I'm happy to be using this yarn from Stash. That wasn't the plan. I had originally bought some sport weight raw work which was very bouncy, lofty, wooden spun, and was way too thick for the needle size and the gauge I was needing. So I scrubbed that plan and used some stash because I didn't want to buy uh, yarn for a test knit twice <laughs> for the same test knit. So I'm happy to be using some stash for that. To be honest, so this project is satisfying in the sense that it challenges me. It was a bit of a harder construction, like there were more instructions for the yoke, like you have to change needle sizes, you have to make your increases. The color work is more challenging. The pattern is really long, so you have to like stay focused and only follow instructions for your size. It's really thorough and well written, but it's just a lot. And then this is my second fingering weight sweater and it's all over color work. And I guess I'm, I'm more enjoying the knits that are like rewarding and you get to reach the next step like really fast but that one just seemed like endless and the yoke was just like adding more and more stitches so it was getting slower and slower to do just one round and I wasn't enjoying that so to be honest I'm looking forward to finishing this and my head has just been spinning with all the ideas I have for summer and and different jumpers I want to do so I just want to finish this finish this jumper but that's not going to happen if I don't work on it so when I finished um, the, the first test knit, this one, I rewarded myself and said to myself, you get to cast on something that you wanted to do. So last time I showed my swatch for the Levitate Wrap by My Favorite Things Knitwear. That one is made with um, Isiger Eco Soft in the color 8S and Isiger Trio in the color Chestnut, I think. Details will be below. And uh, EcoSoft is a blown yarn in a cotton net with alpaca fibers in it. And Trio is a lace weight with 50% flax, 30% cotton, 20% bamboo. Yeah, it's chestnut. And I don't really know why they're held together, to be perfectly honest. Is it for gauge? Is it for color? Is it for... Um, fiber content. I don't know why you'd hold an alpaca with like a bamboo and linen and flax together. Uh, someone on Ravelry has tried to do it without the strand of trio to see if it was necessary and then they said that they felt like it was necessary so it did add something. So I guess uh, that's something to consider. 
Mine is a little bit off gauge. I went down the needle size. It's meant to be done on 6mm, but I did it on 5.5. So mine might be a little smaller than it's meant to be, but I'm doing size small, and usually I'm between extra small and small, which means that I'll be on the smaller side of the small size, so it won't have too, too much ease. So that's perfect. That's what I wanted. So I'll show you what I've got. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen like the little updates. It's been going so fast. So here's the yarns that I'm using. It's like lovely brown shades. That one seems more purple and that one seems more like warm, but together like they just, like that one gets swallowed by this one because of how plump that one is. So um, it's not adding much visibility. So hopefully I get to show you in a meaningful way. Yeah, there we go. So that's the, the wrap. So uh, it's a um, drop shoulder, so you cast them at the back, do some increases for shaping, pick up left shoulder, pick up right shoulder. You don't join at the front because it's a cardigan. So you just keep going down, but you join under the armholes. There we go. And then after that, you pick up all around and you make this double knit. It's not a button band because there's no buttons, but it's a double knit edge, which looks stunning. And double knitting takes a while, but because this gauge is so big, it went really fast to make the double knitting, like that was over a couple of days. And then now I've picked up the stitches underneath and I'm working a double knitted edge on the other like direction. So it's like perpendicular to this one, which is it's really great. I think the thing that I'm liking so much about this project is how addictive it is, how soft the fabric is. And just how interesting the construction is. So that's the thing that I'm definitely not, is, is not bored. Because by the time you reach the end of a step, you're already doing the next step. And the steps are so different than what, what I usually do. Even though it's a drop shoulder, there's like the double knitting going on. And then there's going to be like the ties to do. The sleeves as well, they don't have ribbing at the end. I think they have a folded edge, which I've never done before. There's a project on Ravelry that has really, really good notes because the pattern is really detailed. I will say like there's tips everywhere and the tips are really helpful. So it's from my favorite things knitwear. She, I like the way that she writes her pattern. I think she has a right balance between like not too much detail and not um, too little. But there were a few times where I thought if I had never done a double knitted band, I might struggle. So there's a project on Ravelry that I've linked on my Ravelry that is really helpful if you've not done it, which could um, set you right in case you need a little bit more like visual explanation. But if you've done a double knitted edge before, it's okay. I think what's hard as well is like, there's a lot of vocabulary to explain what you, she's doing. So like she refers to like the front edge, the bottom edge, the edge, and it's just like, you need to remember what she's talking about and visualize it. But if you just follow the steps one by one and you, you take it one at a time, it, it's okay. I'm really, really enjoying this. I think it's going to be really comfy. The only modification I've done is I've added two rounds because I wanted a bit more length. I did it at the place that she suggests doing that. So um, yeah, I just did that. Because people have said that it's quite cropped, but also it might block out. People have said like at first it wasn't uh, a good length, but then it, it lengthened a little bit during blocking, so uh, I guess I'll be looking at for that. I'm really happy with the color that I chose. A lot of people took like a gray, and I guess gray is safe and I would have liked it, but I really wanted something brown since I liked how the single malt I knitted my boyfriend, I liked how it looked on me, even though I had kind of like written off brown as a color for me. But yeah, I'm really liking this one. So yeah. I just need to, like, I have the Pictus Pullover test net, which I have to do, and then the Levitate Wrap, which is, like, my reward. And when those two are going to be finished, that's when I can get into uh, my future plans, which I will now talk about, as well as my acquisitions. So, um, first acquisition, it was actually a gift from my grandma for Easter. She very kindly gave me some, like, money, which I, I bought yarn with. So that's her gift to me. I bought it from SKD Yarn, which is like my number one recommendation for Sandless Garn yarn. They have like basically all their qualities, uh, very affordable, very good color range, very quick delivery. 
I got a couple of booklets from Scentless Garden and I want to make the Frankie sweater. So I'll show a picture here of what it looks like. Normally it was made with Borska's alpaca, which is like a, a brushed alpaca, a very thick yarn. And it was quite pricey. Like I put the yarn I wanted in my basket and s saw how much it was. And I wasn't feeling really comfortable, comfortable with that. Even though it was a gift, I just thought I'd rather uh, get a cheaper yarn and get a couple of extra goodies rather than spend all of it on, on that sweater quantity. So instead I went with Sendless Garn Kos, Kos. And uh, here's the color I went for. It's like a petrol color. It's really, really hard to capture. Even this, I guess, doesn't even look that much like it does, or it depends on the lighting. Um, it's a green slash blue. It's got some like flecks of yellow in it and turquoise and dark blue and electric blue. Uh, it's really, really nice, like a, a bottle. Uh, I'm really happy, it's really soft. Cos is also a blown yarn, if I recall correctly. It's a 62% baby alpaca, 9% wool, 29% nylon. 50 grams is 150 meters. I think I got six or seven balls of this and it should see me for the Frankie Ganser. I don't know when I'll do it. I don't know if Kos is going to be like a, a summer yarn, like appropriate or not. I don't know if I'll overheat in it or if it'll be like a good transitional piece for like because of the cotton and like how light and airy it might be. And it would work up quite fast. And I really want to show off to my grandma like the nice jumper that she um, enabled me to make. So I don't know, but I'm really happy with my color choice. And usually what I do is I either do the color that people design the pattern in or I see the tester versions and I take one of the tester versions but that one I just went on the cost page on SKD yarns browsed the page picked the color that I liked the most um I, I didn't want it to be like a neutral like it have been I could have been a, a light gray sweater but I was feeling quite like bold I guess so happy with my choice I hope I'm not speaking too fast I feel like I've been rushing through this and I've been really like all over the place, but I hope that everything I want to say is coming across and that you're having an enjoyable time watching this podcast. The next thing then that I got during that purchase with the extra money was that I got some yarn to make the Leon sweater by Petite Knit, which is a new pattern that she released recently, which is stripes. And it's like a, a saddle shoulder, like contiguous sleeve. Like it's very like nice and fitted. Well, it has positive ease, but the shoulders seem very fitted and like a different construction than usual, which really attracted me to this pattern. She does it in like the almond and navy colorway, which I don't like. And a lot of the tester versions were kind of doing that too. Um, there was one version that was almond and bright orange or bright red, which looked really great. But I was trying to think of a different one to do and uh, hello, I'm podcasting. Okay. okay. Are you going in the living room? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Love you. So I saw a version ages ago of sweater number 22 by Maria Verden. I'll put the photo here. Uh, I've talked about this account before because I say, used the same inspiration to make my sycamore sweater by Petite Net. Uh, Maria has an amazing Instagram. I recommend you follow her. Um, and she made that sweater in like a marzipan and lilac colorway and I loved it. So I thought, even though I don't like purple, I think lilac could be a good way to ease myself in that color, if that's even a thing. So I already had a lot of Sendless Garn Sunday in kit that was left over for a different project. So I didn't have to buy too, too much to make that sweater. So here's what I got. Here's my color palette. And it makes me really happy to see it. Like see what I'm wearing now I feel like I'm entering my pastel era which I think was always meant to be su suiting for me like I was doing those like color analysis online and it was saying that pastel colors would look good on me but I didn't like pastels but I think now I do so like baby blue pistachio pink uh, mint green pistachio green and then lilac I think like this is great for me and and I like it so uh, what more to ask so I'll be doing it in, in the the kit 1015 color as the main color and then this is um, 4631 as the contrast color and I think I'm going to do size small 
to get a lot of ease because I'm really liking how comfortable and oversized this one is. So I think that will be my next cast on after I finish the Levitate wrap. No. Well, after I finish the, the Pictus Pullover test net, unless I finish the Levitate wrap first, but I hope not because that means I'm late on the Pictus Pullover. So I'm happy to have only needed to buy a few skines to be able to make up like a full sweater quantity, like everything just fell into place. Okay, the next purchase that I did was from Zekami. The they recently did a shop update where they updated it with like lots of colorways that they had dyed during like the this year's shows. It was great to see a few colorways returning that they had been posting like from before that I didn't get. So I bought two things. I bought two t-shirt quantities and they're very quite different. So here's the, the two that I got. I'll show you some photos on screen, I guess, but um, this one here is my favorite. It's called Lick Eskimos, and it's 70% baby alpaca, 20% silk, 10% cashmere, fingering weight, 400 meters for 100 grams. It's very drapey, as you can see. It's a beautiful kind of green tinted base with some like orangey flecks and like some purple blue flecks as well. It's just, it's really soft, both literally and like style speaking. I'm awful at describing colors and yarns, but I'm, I'm really loving the way that this feels and looks. The two skins I got look a little different in the sense that one is more orangey than the other, but it might be that the orange is hidden in this one. But at any rate, I'll be alternating skins when I make the, the project. And the project I will make with this is the Cozy Classic Light by Jessie Made Design, which I'll put on the screen if you don't know which one it is. Now I'll try to make it with as long sleeves as I can. So I've got 800 meters with this. I think this will be enough for me to make at least three quarter length sleeve if I'm making size two, I think. So we'll see. I'm, I'm really quite tempted to do it as soon as possible, but I need to think carefully about what I put on my needles because I can only knit so much at one time. And then here's the second colorway, and this is Boomy, and this is 100% Corydale. So this one is very self-standing, plump, round color, and it's like a tan with some like orangey bits, some kind of green rust. It's got some speckles as well. I'm obsessed with it. it it's really fun, like it's really, full and it's got like some dark here as well um it, it's really really nice and my plans for that were to also make a t-shirt and i was thinking of making the toast to tea so i'll either wait for rebecca to release the fingering weight version and knit it like that or other plan is to hold it with a second strand to make a dk weight and this is where I was hesitating about the fiber content of the second strand. So this is Corydale, which is wool. I was thinking of maybe holding it with one strand of alpaca one, um, which is the same thing that I was holding with this, like in a rust colorway or like a tan camel colorway to kind of just go well with that without, um, like I don't, want, I don't want to marl it and make it clash, uh, but I don't want to make it completely disappear either, which is why I don't want to hold it with a mohair. Um, and then the second option would be to hold this with a summer content to make it a t-shirt. Uh, so for example, I could hold it with like a, a linen or cotton or a blend of the two. So maybe like a wool cotton blend that would also be the same kind of camel color. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to swatch and I probably will swatch with yarns I have on hand in terms of like the fiber content, even though it's not the color that I want. And then once I know about that, I'll purchase the yarn in the color that I want. And I'll swatch again to be sure. Unless you have any good recommendations of, of what do you think this would go well with as a second strand and the reasons why. Uh, please let me know if you have any insights. Super happy with my purchase. They look amazing. I know I had said I would not buy any more Zekami as I still hadn't knitted up my first sweater purchase of Zekami yarn but I ran into some difficulties. I had purchased a second strand to go with my Surrey alpaca, but it turns out that it actually wasn't in stock, so I, I actually couldn't do that order. So that was a bit disappointing, and I ended up 
going back to the drawing board about what yarn to hold with it and in the end I'm just gonna go with a scentless garn sundae in like the almond colorway and then hold it with my brushed alpaca just as an update in case anyone cares about that sweater um, and I don't, know if I'll, I don't know if I'll do it this summer because it's too warm so but I have the yarn for it I already had the almonds because I was gonna make the Friday tea with it as you can see there's like I have a lot of yarn and it's planned for it's earmarked for certain things but then plants change and they all rotate which is fine it's working out it's good to have backups and it's good to have solutions when problems occur so nothing is set in stone and if I'm missing one skein, I can always buy one skein. I of course care about dye lots but there's always work around that except especially if you're holding double strands then it doesn't matter if one of them is a different dye lot because you can kind of like marl it or fade it um, so yeah, I think that that's all my acquisitions and plans and like what's brewing under the surface. As you can see, there's like, a couple t-shirts, the Lyon sweater by Petite Net, and some sock plans that I want to do now that I've like cleared off the sock needles. But what I know for sure, and I, I want to, to really get it here uh, for posterity, no more test nets for June, July, I hope. <laughs> uh, because I, I really just have a lot of my own plans to do. So I hope that you liked this episode. I feel like I was talking quite fast, but I think I said everything I wanted to say, so I'm quite happy about that. It was good to catch up again with you all. I am always looking forward to sitting down and recording. Thanks again if you've been here like since the start, and if you've not, if you've just discovered me, then thank you for watching this video. If you haven't subscribed already to my channel, it would be really nice if you did, if you enjoyed the content, give it a like, give it a comment, let me know that you're enjoying what I'm doing, that would be uh, really good to know. I hope that you got some good progress on whatever you were knitting while watching this video, if that's what you were doing, and I'll see you all at the next podcast episode. 